a great offense really depends on having a, a, a super, super defense, I, I believe. And so I think we complemented each other, but I was so, so impressed with how our defense played because we seemed to always get the, the ball at the right moment. That we were always put in a situation where we could really take a lot of chances. And when we did, it really worked out. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. It's another edition of Skull Stories. I'm your host, Mike Wobshaw, inside TCO Studios at Winter Park. Excited to bring you tonight's episode. It's going to feature one of the 50 greatest Vikings, wide receiver Gene Washington. And to help us talk about Gene Washington, we're going to bring in Lindsey Young, who um, is a little bit of a jack-of-all-trades for us at Vikings Entertainment Network. She can talk about the current Vikings. She's got a really good relationship with a lot of former Vikings. She's good at human interest stories. She can do a little bit of it all. So we're going to bring her in in a moment to talk about Gene Washington and then bring you a conversation we got to have with Gene Washington. But first, your current Minnesota Vikings, they're on a roll right now, everyone. They're 5-2, and two, leaders of the NFC North, their most recent victory over the Baltimore Ravens at U.S. Bank Stadium in a game dominated by the defense. Of course, the Vikings have one of the best, if not the best defense in the NFL. And when they're at home, they're even better, surrendering only 15.2 points per game at U.S. Bank Stadium. The Vikings had a very home-heavy schedule in the first half of the season, and they took advantage by starting 5-2. and two. Now, they do the opposite of play at home. They go on the road across the Atlantic Ocean to London to play the Cleveland Browns. More on that later on throughout the week right here on FM 100.3 KFAN. But for now, we want to talk about some Vikings history. It's going to feature Gene Washington. He's our guest tonight on Skull Stories. Before we get to him, it's Lindsey Young who's going to join us right now. Lindsey, you had this conversation with Gene Washington, who, by the way, when he came out of Michigan State um, for the Vikings, part of, I don't know, Let's not call it the best draft class in Vikings history because we, you know, we don't want to criticize or critique other really good ones. No, but it was up there. Yeah, I mean, um, let's see. So we have Alan Page, Gene Washington, and Clinton Jones mm-hmm. in the first, all in the first round. Right. And then Bobby Bryant. Bobby Bryant yeah. came as well. So I mean, pretty good. <laughs> look at those guys and the impact that they made over yeah. the years. It's incredible. All right, um, you guys had a great conversation with Gene. We're going to get to it right now, everyone. Here is. One of the 50 greatest Vikings of all time, Gene Washington, chatting with the Vikings Entertainment Network. Gene, thanks so much for joining us today. When you look at your draft class, it was a pretty decent class. You had you, Clint Jones, Alan Page, Bobby Bryant. What was your experience coming into the league at the same time as those guys? Yeah, well, it, 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 it was very interesting uh, uh, coming in with Alan. And uh, because uh, Allen played at Notre Dame, and we were coming off of that 10-10 tie, uh, they were national champions. That they, they they were co-national champions with us. Uh, we were undefeated going into that 10-10 tie, and they were undefeated. However, uh, Allen Notre Dame team they had one more game to play it was USC, and of course they played after that 10-10 tie, and I think they beat USC about 50 to nothing. But on, on the other hand, we were co-national champions. Uh, we were all coming into the Vikings in a situation where uh, uh, Clinton was number one, and of course, Allen was uh, also first round draft choice, uh, Bobby Bryant. And uh, the Vikings had not been too successful, so, so we were all coming in as number one draft picks. And uh, uh, it was quite in- interesting how we bonded right away and uh, after that first year, uh, we started winning. That 1969 team is recognized as one of the best Vikings team there's ever been. So what do you remember specifically about that season? I, I, I think one, one of the things I remember about that season, uh, while I am an offensive receiver, but I, I, I was so impressed with how our defense played because uh, as an offensive player, especially wide receiver, you like to get the ball Uh, as often as you can, and our defense played so well that year that that we were always put in a situation where we could really take a lot of chances, and when we did, in many, when I say chances, it it, it really worked out. It really, uh, a a great offense 
uh, really depends on having a, a, a super, super defense, I, I believe. And so I think we complemented each other, but I was so, so impressed with how our defense played because we seem to always get the, the ball at the right moment. And, and I'll always remember how important that was. Uh, uh, and, and, and at that time, we were in 69, we were, we were kind of a young team because it, I think it was only my fourth year in the league. And, 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 and we, all, of, all of those draft choices had really paid off. And of course, Joe, had, Joe was having a super year. So it was, it was uh, we, we all played so, so, so well together. We always hear about the success that Fran Tarkenton had here in Minnesota, and that praise is definitely well-deserved, but you played more often with a different quarterback. What was it like playing with Joe Cap? Uh, it, it, it was really, really outstanding, and, I, and, and uh, the reason it was is that uh, my rookie year, uh, uh, Joe was just coming in from Canada, and I, I had no knowledge of who Joe Cap was. <laughs> and uh, didn't really follow Canadian football back in those days. But uh, Joe was a great, great leader, very inspiring, and uh, he played hard. And uh, it was more than just being a quarterback because uh, one of the things I remember by, by Joe, he, he refused to run out of bounds. He, that was something that uh, usually quarterbacks, you know, you don't want to get hurt. They have all these rules now, which is, which is necessary because you need to have a quarterback. But back in the days we played, uh, uh, if you lose a quarterback, you know, that could be for the whole season. So we wanted to protect Joe as much as we could, uh, but he didn't care. He, he just wanted to make sure he got that extra yard. Uh, but he was very, very inspiring, a lot of charisma. And, uh, and I'm so happy that I had a chance to, to play with him. And, of course, uh, uh, a natural-born leader. There's no, no question about that. Joe was known for his phrase, 40 for 60. When you hear that, what does that mean to you? You have 40 players who are playing for 60 minutes. And uh, he coined that phrase uh, at the time that um, uh, he, he was named the, the most valuable player that year for the team. And he refused to take the trophy. And he says, uh, there, you know, the, as, from a team standpoint, we're, we're all in this together. And it was 40 for 60, you know, 40 guys for 60 minutes. And that's how he, how he played, how he lived uh, being a football player. And, uh, and that, uh, that's something I'll always remember him for because uh, uh, when he called, when he, when he was in the huddle and calling plays, uh, there was something about Joe Cap. Uh, the way he presented it in, those, in, in, in the play calling situation, uh, it was a given that we would complete that pass. It was a given that, uh, that Bill, Brown, Bill Brown or Dave Osborne, you know, would, would make those yards or Clint Jones would be a runner and, and make sure we got that, 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 that three yards that we needed. And so it was a, a team experience. And he, he just wanted to make sure that we won and he played with his heart. Of course, we have to ask you about Bud. What was it like playing under Bud Grant? Uh, I, I enjoyed playing with Bud, playing for Bud. Uh, that, that was one of the moments of my, my career that I always remember. Uh, the only, thing, only negative thing about uh, playing for Bud, uh, I didn't like the cold weather. And he, uh, in, in terms of not having heaters and in terms of not, as a wide receiver, you know, you got to keep your hands and your fingers warm. Uh, but, but from a coaching standpoint and the coaching staff that we had with Bernsey, uh, Bernsey was our offensive coordinator. I, I, I think they worked so well together. And Bud was, uh, was really, really in tune and pulling us all together as, as, as a team. Uh, I, I, I still remember uh, the part that we had to uh, stand in line for the national anthem. You had to make sure that you had your hands over your heart and your helmets at the right uh, on the side and make sure it was the right height. And, uh, but he was, he, was, he, he was one of the best coaches in the National Football League 
uh, Hall of Fame, very de de deservingly, and, uh, and it was such an honor to have him as my head coach. I'll always, uh, I'll always be thankful. Uh, I was blessed to have him as my coach. Great guy. More from former Viking Gene Washington coming up after the break. Before we go to break, a programming note to tell you about another former Viking. It's Jim Kleinsaucer. He joins host Mike Musman, and you should too. They will be at the new Poor Richards in Apple Valley on Thursday at 5.30 p.m. For a live broadcast of Vikings Country, you could win some great prizes, including tickets in the Miller Lite Lounge at U.S. Bank Stadium. Visit vikings.com slash vikingscountry for more info and a full schedule. And for the rest of Skull Stories, please stay tuned. We'll be back after this. Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Skull Stories. I'm your host, Mike Wabshaw. Our conversation with Gene Washington continues in a moment, but first, be the first to know breaking Vikings news, access video on demand, and get ticket alerts all on your phone with the Minnesota Vikings app. Download today in the App Store and Google Play. It's Lindsay Young who's going to join us right now. Lindsay, you had this conversation with Gene Washington, and you know a lot about a project that he was involved with and that his daughter was involved with. What do you remember about having a chance to chat with Mr. Washington? I've been able to talk to him a couple different times, but it was really fun to get to really dive into more of his history and his personal experiences. And then I was also able to talk, like you said, about this project that he's been a part of. It's a documentary that his daughter Maya is working on and kind of get to hear a little bit from the two of them and about their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I have a close relationship with my dad that's you know, has a lot to do with football and things like that. And so it was yeah. fun for me to get to hear from him and from Maya and, and kind of hear their heart on some things. Yeah. And so the subject of the documentary and some of the conversation, I mean, we're going to talk Vikings football and Gene Washington, but also um, kind of some social issues in Gene Washington, because a big part of the documentary is the integration of African-Americans into football teams and, and Gene Washington at Michigan State. So what's it like talking about a subject like that that has sensitivity with someone who lived in that era and had to deal with that. Yeah, it's definitely a heavy topic and one that I didn't know if I really had the authority, I guess, to talk on and to speak about when we mm -hmm. went into this interview. But it's really awesome talking to Jean and to Maya because they're so open about it. And Jean is so passionate about talking about that part of his life um, in the way that he was really kind of at the forefront of integration into mm -hmm. college football at the time. And, and I think he's been able to see, too, like how things have progressed since that time and how he played a key part in that. And yeah. so since he was really open, that made it a lot easier to have those discussions. Our conversation with Gene Washington continues now. A heavy conversation, but some really good stuff from former Viking Gene Washington and his daughter, Maya. You know, in the past, we have talked to Greg Coleman, Jim Marshall, Alan Page, Carl Eller, and all of them have had individual stories that they've been able to share of challenges with racism that they have faced in their lives. Do you have a personal story or two you'd like to share that can exemplify some of the challenges you've had to face? I'm from LaPorte, Texas, and uh, the city of LaPorte did not have a school accommodations for black students beyond the eighth grade because of segregation. I also competed in a completely all-black league uh, because whites and blacks could not compete against each other or we could not play on the same teams. All of the major schools in Texas, uh, the University of Texas, uh, Texas A&M, Baylor, Rice, all of them, those schools were completely segregated against black athletes. None of the major schools that we know today, uh, no student, no black students could attend those universities. And so I'm very fortunate that I had a chance to go on to Michigan State University it was Bubba Smith and Bubba Smith's father, Coach Willie Ray Smith, that actually uh, recommended my dad to Michigan State. And that on top of that, um, Duffy Doherty was basically in the process of finally fully integrating the, the game, uh, that he was consciously going into the South, recruiting black players when no one else was doing it. So throughout the South, he was well known to put on these coaching clinics, especially for the black coaches because the black coaches could not, uh, could not uh, participate in integrated uh, uh, coaching clinics. 
And so based upon that, I, I had that opportunity to go on to Michigan State. So you begin your college career at Michigan State, a place you and many of your teammates grew comfortable. But that didn't mean that there wasn't still some adversity beyond East Lansing. Is that correct? Uh, we were a national champions in two undefeated seasons, if you will. And we were seldom on national television. Uh, for example, the University of Alabama, uh, my, my, my junior year, they were undefeated. And of course, that's the same year we were undefeated. And of course, the people down south felt that they, uh, Alabama should be number one. It was against the law for Alabama to play integrated teams. But when you think about the South, if you think about Kentucky and LSU, all of those Southern schools, most of them didn't, could not play black players because black students could not attend their universities. For me, I've always grown up seeing African Americans playing football. Um, so it never occurred to me, you know, when I thought about uh, segregation, um, how that impacted professional sports or even college sports. But my dad's team was the first that actually looks like the teams we see today, to have 23 black players and 11 starters, um, a black quarterback. Uh, a lot of these things were pretty groundbreaking, and it's kind of mind-boggling because we're talking about, like, 1963. We really looked at it at, at, as really being a team, a family-type situation. The civil rights movement, uh, we, we realized all of this was was around us, if you will. But in the meantime, it was strictly more of a team type thing, and we were all in this, in this together. So 1964, 1965, um, those were all really important big years for sort of um, shifting the uh, actual laws that supported um, segregation in the South and um, really moved forward the, the move to integrate. We all lived in the dorms together with all of our teammates. And uh, the family situation uh, in terms of our playing football uh, together, uh, we took classes together. And all, all of this, of course, was, was very new to me in terms of uh, attending classes in an integrated situation. It really sounds like Michigan State was the perfect place for you to end up at at that time. The community that I was brought up in, if you will, uh, they understood how important education was. Uh, once I got to Michigan State, I felt right, right, right away there was a great family atmosphere. We didn't have the racial concerns, but we all came from completely segregated situations, and it really, it really worked great that we were able to, uh, to experience that, kind of what I experienced when I was growing up, because the community, my parents, uh, everybody worked together just to make sure that education was always number one. It was never, sports was very important, but education was always uh, the number one thing that we had to be concerned about. Maya, you've worked so hard on this project. What have you learned about your dad or about the different circumstances that he's lived through? I think we've come a long way, and I'm so grateful for um, my parents' generation, for everything that they worked hard to make sure that I would have opportunities that they didn't have. For me, it's been a blessing to really learn, okay, so how do we approach these next challenges? How do we promote the idea of equality? I feel like there's a lot to be learned from uh, my dad's generation, sort of how they overcome real serious obstacles. Um, and confronted a lot of unfortunate injustice, you know, so that, that we could have the life that we have today, and especially for players in the league today. I, I've been able to learn a lot about Maya, my daughter, in terms of uh, uh, how, how hard she's been working at this over these years. And uh, she recognized my background, my contribution coming out of that completely segregated situation. And when I share stories uh, with her in terms of how, how demeaning it was to be in segregation. It's such a gift and I'm so grateful, not only that my dad and I got to have this really special uh, time to grow in our relationship as a father and daughter, um, but to know that from a historical standpoint, this will be documented for future generations. Um, and other people will have a chance to learn about my dad's story and the stories of many African-American men 
uh, who had similar journeys from segregation uh, to opportunity and how that came through sport. I think that she has learned a lot in looking at my past and where I came from. It's much different, and I, and I think that, uh, and I'm so proud that we both have grown up together, if you will, and, uh, and I'm so proud of her. And then how can people learn more about or support the project that you're working on? So if people are interested in supporting us, which we'd love, um, they can check out our website, redcedarmovie.com. And uh, there's information on uh, the film itself, uh, a link to donate if you'd like to um, support our journey, uh, as well as an opportunity to sign up on our mailing list. So that's a great way to uh, get plugged in. We're also on Facebook and Twitter, so you can find us through the website as well. And uh, the film is called Through the Banks of the Red Cedar. All right, so a really cool, in-depth conversation with Gene Washington about football and family. And actually, um, that's one of the NFL's taglines, football is family. And so with Gene Washington and Maya Lindsay, we have uh, an example of a father and daughter, um, you know, enriching their relationship over sports. And I know you have that with your father as well. So you value that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, that was one of the things that I enjoyed hearing about because I sort of related in that way. And, you know, it's something that my dad and I can talk about a whole bunch of things, but one of the things that we really love to talk about is football and Minnesota sports in general. So so it was a, a really special conversation for me to have with Maya and Jean. Maybe you can watch the game on Sunday with your dad. It's possible, yeah. Yeah, because okay. I can't convince you to come to London with us, right? I will not, I will not be in London. Okay. I will not be on the uh, eight-plus-hour flight there, mm, but... That's not your job. I might go somewhere and get fish and chips or something. Okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah. You know, that would be very festive of yep. you. That's a great idea. Bring your dad with you. All right, thanks, Lindsay. Thanks very much. All right, that's it for this edition of Skull Stories. Thanks for listening and joining us and, and learning more about Gene Washington. Up next for your Minnesota Vikings, as we talked about, they go to London to play the Cleveland Browns. We're looking forward to the game. Of course, you can catch it all across the Vikings Radio Network right here at FM 100.3. Kickoff, though, a different time this week, 8.30 a.m. Central Time kickoff for the Minnesota Vikings on Sunday. They do not play at noon. If you tune in at noon, you're going to miss the whole game. Paul Allen, Pete Bursich, Greg Coleman, and Ben Lieber will bring it to you. We won't be back next week with another edition of Skull Story, so we'll catch you in two weeks. I'm your host, Mike Wabshaw, thanking you for listening. Hope you all have a good rest of the week.